everybody. Thank you for being here this afternoon. Um, so I titled the talk, Gun Violence, Still a Public Health Problem, because I gave the talk last year that gun violence is a public health problem, and it is still a public health problem one year later. So here we are talking about it again. Um, the purpose of this talk is really um, to give you guys a little bit of background, but then also to talk about what AMWA is doing and how you can get involved. So uh, firearm death and injury in the United States, um, is, it's a public health problem and we have huge numbers, um, greater than 35,000 deaths per year. About 60% of these are suicide and 35% are homicide and then the remainder are un accidental or unclassified. There's an estimated 81,000 um, plus uh, non-fatal injuries. We don't uh, count non-fatal injuries. We don't have a, a way to count them. Um, and a lot of the data on this is really imperfect um, in terms of national data banks. So we estimate that, but some um, public health folks think that that could be as high as um, 200,000 per year. And remember that not everybody presents to a hospital. Um, some people take care of their injuries at home. Uh, a lot of uh, record keeping is just not kept. Um, so, here's, so here are the numbers again, um, fatalities and injuries. Um, of the 35,000, about 12,000 of those are murders um, and about 21,000 are suicide. And um, of the injuries, about um, 60,000 are injured in some kind of intentional attack and about 3,700 are survivals of suicide attempts. So you can see that the lethality of means of um, the access to a firearm in the situation of depression and suicide is incredibly high. Uh, this is a uniquely American problem um, among uh, Western and um, developed countries. This is much higher in the United States. The next is Canada, um, and then goes all the way down to Japan, where two people were shot um, the entire year last year in Japan. Um, so who does uh, gun violence affect? Um, so for those of us who care for children, pediatricians, not pediatricians, people who care about children, people who have children, um, this is a problem. Um, so about uh, 17,000 uh, children and teens are shot every year in the United States, um, and about uh, 2,700 of those children die. Um, many of these, you know, there's a lot going on right now with children and teens and schools and um, we sent a, a delegation over to the march here today in Philadelphia. Um, we have high school students speaking out about this. It is a problem certainly, but it is much more of a problem in the daily uh, violence that's happening in the homes and the daily violence that's happening in um, cities in smaller amounts that doesn't make the news. So 17 kids in a high school makes the news, but one here, one there, um, you know, a, a family violence, an accidental shooting rarely ever makes the news anymore. Um, American children are 17 times more likely to be murdered by a firearm than their counterparts in other com um, countries and 10 times more likely to die by suicide as well. Um, who does it affect? Uh, minority populations. So black youth are 10 times more likely to be murdered with a gun than white youth in the United States. And the rate of firearm death um, for black males uh, ages 15 to 19 is four times higher than the national average for uh, non-black, and it's uh, represented by this graph. Women, um, so intimate partner violence accounts for about 15% of all violent crime seen in the United States. Uh, women aged 18 to 24 them are most commonly abused and there's really um, difficult reporting on this because it's generally not considered to be domestic abuse in many municipalities unless the couple is married. Um, so we're seeing a lot of uh, intimate partner violence that is not being accounted for, particularly intimate partner gun violence that's not being accounted for because the couple are not married. Um, over 51 women are shot to death by their partners each month. Um, the presence, if there is domestic violence in the home and you add a gun into the home, the likelihood that the woman in that home is gonna die is increased by 500%. So the presence of a gun in the presence of domestic violence is incredibly dangerous combination. Uh, who does gun violence affect? There's a lot of uh, talk about mental illness and the psychiatric population and mental illness as being a problem and in terms of perpetrators, uh, not true. The mentally ill are far, far more likely to be the victims of gun violence than they are to be the perpetrator. 
half of all suicide deaths are completed with a firearm, and um, population gun levels are significantly associated with the uh, completed suicide, particularly in children and adolescents. We don't have a lot of good data. There are not a lot of good studies about guns, but there is really, really good data here. If you put a depressed child or adolescent in a home with a gun, you are increasing the risk that that child is going to die by suicide at the hands of that gun. So what can we do? What can we do to reduce gun violence? Um, well, gun ownership and firearm homicides uh, rates in the United States, gun ownership is the number one um, uh, associated cause of firearm homicide in the United States, associated factor related. So we just have a lot of guns in the United States. They're everywhere. Um, they're ubiquitous in homes. The average, in, in houses that have a gun, the average number of guns is seven. So, um, and in home, in firearm home, owner, home, in homes with firearms, more than a third have some kind of high capacity rifle, so like an AR-15. What else can we do? Universal background checks. Um, so this is really, really important. This is a policy solution. It's been shown to work in states where universal background checks are and the laws are um, implemented and enforced. We see um, fewer rates. This is some data from Missouri that showed um, that the rate actually went up. So they repealed universal background checks in Missouri and the rates of uh, firearm homicides were lower and then they went up once we got rid of universal background checks. So what's the big deal about universal background checks? What's everybody talking about? So, and the background check loopholes and things like that. So there are many laws that say that in order to purchase a firearm, you have to have, a, there's a universal background check. So if I walk into Cabela's right now and want to buy a, a firearm, I have to go through a background check system. But there are two big loopholes. One is if the background check takes longer than 24 hours, they are compelled to sell me that firearm without. Like I cannot be delayed more than 24 hours in getting my access to that firearm. So if the background background check takes longer than 24 hours, I just get the gun. The second is all of the gun shows. So this is like the, you know, at the, the convention centers, they have gun shows. It's called the gun show loophole. And what it is is that the, um, the laws on the books currently say that if you are a collector or um, uh, or if you are transferring a weapon um, in, as like a gift, um, that you don't have to have background checks for those transfers. So many people call themselves um, collectors at these gun shows and they're selling these rifles and handguns as collectors uh, without uh, background checks on those sales. Um, it's also just incredibly easy to find somebody on like Facebook or Craigslist to sell you a, a gun out of a trunk. Um, stronger laws regarding domestic violence and firearm access. So again, um, when we have laws that remove the firearms out of the home of domestic violence, um, where, where there's been shown domestic violence, the rate of gun homicide of the women in those homes goes down. Um, Again, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of loopholes in these laws. Stalkers and dating partners are not included in the federal laws that, um, that uh, bar um, domestic violence convicts from owning and buying guns. And there's also no way to collect the guns that are already owned by a domestic abuser. So if you have somebody who has a gun and then they are convicted of a domestic violence felony or misdemeanor, there's no way to go and capture the gun that they already have. They just can't buy any more guns in the future unless they go through one of the loopholes, which are huge. Uh, child access prevention laws, so about two million children in the United States live in a, gun, in a home with an unsecured firearm. That means one that is loaded and ready to be fired. Um, not locked, not locked separately from the ammunition, which is the way that they are recommended to be stored in the United States. Um, and about greater than 100 um, children are killed. So stricter um, in 2013 in these unintentional shootings. So they got a hold of the gun, they were playing with it, and they either shot themselves or shot another child. Um, the stricter um, child access prevention laws that hold the adult owner of that firearm responsible for that child's death as though they pulled the trigger um, have been shown to increase um, or decrease the rate of uh, 
child death. And then gun safety education. So gun safety education that's geared toward, geared toward children is not effective. So you can't tell a child not to play with a gun. There's a very elegant study that showed that um, among little boys, um, they did a gun safety education show with that, like little thing, little, and then they immediately, immediately, 10 minutes later, put them in a room with like a fake gun hidden somewhere, like up on a shelf somewhere, and they found that gun and fired it within seven minutes after just having completed a gun safety demonstration. So you cannot hold children accountable for, um, for their, um, for their own safety. So you have to, you have to engage parents in safe storage. The Dickey Amendment, there's a lot of um, talk about this right now. So the Dickey Amendment came about in 1996, which said that none of the funds available to the Center for Disease Control and Prevention may be used to advocate for or promote gun control. That is specific language. It's not a ban exactly, but it has had a remarkably chilling effect on our ability to get federal funding for gun control, or, uh, for gun safety education and gun um, uh, safety research in the United States. Here's research funding by disease. You can see gun violence is the outlier. Um, so we know that gun violence spreads through populations like a disease. So if you are related to a perpetrator or a victim, you are more likely to become a victim yourself. There's an elegant study out of Yale showing that if you are in the cell phone contacts of somebody who is either a perpetrator or a victim, you are 10 times more likely to become a victim yourself just because you're in their cell phone contacts. Um, so we try to take a public health approach. This is what we do as physicians. This is what we know how to do as physicians. And this is what AMWA's um, stance is on this. So our, we believe in primary prevention, preventing the disease from happening itself, secondary prevention, so these are things like hospital-based violence intervention programs and cure violence type programs, which go on to prevent somebody from becoming a victim again, um, recidivism, and tertiary prevention, so um, providing support to families and victims um, and communities who have been afflicted by gun violence. Um, so here's, I mean, this is basically the public health model. It demonstrates that we, it, this is a problem that affects families, communities, and entire populations, and the public health model shows all of the things that we can do to prevent it. So what are we doing here in AMWA, and what can you guys do? So we started the Gun Violence Task Force two years ago. It is co-chaired by myself and Alana Rossman from WashU in St. Louis. Um, we have uh, come up with a position that represents AMWA, and what does AMWA think about this? And so our positions are that we think that uh, medical students should be uh, safe in their medical schools, that we think that you should be free of the, the threat of gun violence in the confines of the medical school walls and the hospital. Um, we think that doctors should be able to talk about gun safety with their patients within the confines of the physician-patient relationship. So just as you suggest car seat use, you can also suggest firearm safety, and that should not be infringed upon. Um, uh, we believe that gun violence should be treated and taught like a public health issue and that it should be taught in medical schools, um, that we have a right to teach, um, to teach this as a public health problem in, in medical schools. So here's our task force. Here's sort of our organizational tree and what we do. And um, anybody who wants to do anything can get involved. Um, we would welcome the work. We definitely need people to help with this. So we spent a lot of time being very thoughtful about how to organize this task force and about what our goals are going to be. And now it's time to roll it out and, and get it out there. So I run sort of the outward arm. Um, more is able as our advocacy and community engagement lead. And so what we do is write sign on letters. We write letters that you guys can fill in your names and send to your senators. And we also represent AMWA to the larger gun violence prevention movement. So when there is something that's going to Congress from a large group of physician organizations or something like that. We review it. We make sure it's consistent with our stated um, objectives that we have as an organization, and we decide whether or not that we're, we're going to sign on to that. Um, Aaron Barnhart is our communications and social media lead. Everybody in this room can take out their phone right now and go to Twitter and follow us at AMWAGVTF. Even if you don't want to get involved in the task force, follow us on Twitter, retweet us, help us out, get, us, get the word out there. We 
really try to populate it with high quality public health information. A lot of really good um, articles that come um, out of, out of our medical journals. So I think it's a really, really great resource and we really work hard to keep that um, very high quality. Um, and then we also manage Facebook and any press releases. And then there's um, sort of an inward facing arm. So what is the gun violence task force um, providing to the members of this organization? Um, so the volunteer outreach and membership lead basically recruits interest from all of you and manages that. And then the student outreach and education lead um, is Jen Tuvison, and she's also working with um, a couple of surgeons from WashU who are working on developing curriculum that can be deployed to the um, chapters of AMWA. So if you have an hour and you can order a bunch of pizzas and uh, um, do a PowerPoint with some movie clips and things like that as an event in your medical school, we have, we have it for you. It's all ready to go. It's in a toolkit. We have the handouts. We have the slide deck. Um, all you have to do is order the pizza and get a room. Okay, so we can we can provide that with you so that you can take that back to your medical schools and share it with your colleagues. Um, if you have six hours, if you have a faculty member who is willing to give an elective and that elective is going to be 12 or 20 hours, we have a curriculum for all sorts of levels, medical student, resident, faculty, and um, for varying amounts of time, one hour, six hours, 20 hours. So please get in touch with us. We are happy to give this all to you. It's all part of um, becoming, it's all part of belonging to this organization, organization and it is the main work product of our task force. Um, we also need help to continue to develop and update and keep these things up to date. So that is what we are doing. Um, you can, here's our um, information. You can follow us on Twitter. And um, if you are interested in joining the task force, you can join me at the um, meeting, the committee meeting this afternoon, or you can email amwagunviolencetaskforce at gmail.com. Just email us uh, with your interests. We're going to be sending out a doodle poll in the next couple of weeks to try to gauge everybody's interest and get everybody placed into what they want to do. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.